Hello everyone, Dave Lander here from DaveLander.com. This is the week in charts. Turn on the flux capacitor. <laughs> Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time to find the show. Usually, though, if you go to my website, DaveLander.com, not the members area, DaveLander.com, the homepage. There's usually a banner ad with a countdown. In fact, that's usually there all week long if you scroll down to the bottom of the website. And if you can't find that, go to DaveLander.com slash webinar. I know I haven't updated that in a couple of weeks, but it'll bring you to the current show. Once you register, you registered for a long, long time until I forget to add a show. But I put a show out there in February of 2022 or something, so we should be good for a while. All right, what are we talking about? Well, I have a lot to say about current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. Uh, we have a smaller crowd tonight, so we should be able to get to everybody's picks. If you don't mind, ask about one at a time and wait till we get to the live charts for that. Now, I got to thinking, you better brush up on your market timing. It was kind of interesting. A couple of days ago, I was working on my stock chart show, and everything was kind of going along swimmingly with the markets. And I figured I was going to talk about my plug-in, and that, that'll be posted tomorrow on my website homepage, daylander.com. Anyway, I was thinking, I woke up thinking, hey, you know, it's good. You know, what? maybe I shouldn't be talking about market timing because the market's just going up lately. And then all of a sudden it came in, the futures were down 55 points. And before I came in my office, I was thinking the best time to talk about market timing is when the market's doing okay. The best time to buy flood insurance is when the skies are clear. Recently we had 14 inches of rain and then it rained yesterday or day before like a cow pissing on a flat rock. <laughs> it was horrible. And uh, fortunately, we were high and dry, but it's not a good time to try to buy flood insurance then. By, the, by that time, it's too late. And if you live in uh, Louisiana or Gulf Coast, when a, when a uh, hurricane's on the way, you can't get any insurance. All right, I want to touch upon profit centers, leverage ETFs, both good and bad. And I want to admit a few things. I want to admit that I get stressed out. I want to admit that I don't have all the answers. And I want to throw out some questions and show you some of the answers that I'm working on. And that'll make more sense when we get to it. I want to talk a little bit about discretion, especially as it, uh, as it relates to stop next. And that'll make sense in a second. And there's a, several other things I'm going to cover tonight. In fact, there's so much. Rather than tell you about it, let's just dive right in. This is flame screen. As you, can know, as you know, you can lose money trading. You try to say, I was to sum it up, borrowing a line from Greg Morris, all predictions about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So again, now's a really good time to brush up on your market timing. Although the rain has already started, possibly. <laughs> it's a good time to understand a little bit about market timing. The thing to realize, and this is a point I'm gonna drive home as we go through this, is that 50% or more haircuts are not that uncommon. So losing half of your retirement or junior's college fund sucks, <laughs> to put it mildly. And there's a lot of stress that goes with that. And without throwing too many people under the bus, there's a few things that I'll, I'll flesh out there. And believe me, it's very important to understand market timing. Now, the simplest of all systems, which I set out to design, and I think I've succeeded, is what I call the TFM 10% system. And it'll make more sense on the chart, but there's the rules. Buy when the market, uh, my, my, my Kunas just slipped out. You hear that? I said, there's the rules, cha. <laughs> Buy when the market is less than 10% away from its 50-week closing high. In other words, near C. Now, C is defined... If a market's gonna go from A to B to C, it's gonna to have to go through B along the way. And we have a, an IPO pattern called buy at B and a couple of variants of that thereof. And when I approached this market timing thing, I said, well, you know, if a market loses, is gonna lose 50% of its value, it's gonna lose 10% first. So as long as it's within 10%, within 10 of its 50 week closing high, it's probably doing okay. And, uh, so you want to buy when it's within 10% of its 50-week closing high. And then after I played around with it a little bit, I said a whipsaw filter would probably be nice. And I discovered that if we had two weeks of Landry light, that would also help to keep you from getting whipsawed back in a little 
too early. Now, the downside is a little bit different. As soon as you're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high, in other words, you're no longer near C, and the close is less than a 50-week moving average, you don't wait for daylight. And I'll show you why in just one second. So this was the last buy signal back in, uh, I guess, July of 2020. And we're still long from that signal, if you were trading this system, of course. So there's the 50-day simple moving average. And then above it, the green line is what I call the buy line. And down below is percent from closing high. This is built into Metastock. And it's also, I think it's built into Metastock. And it's also part of my ACP plugin for stockcharts.com. So the bottom is just a histogram representation. And, you know, maybe it'd be cool if I flip that over and as opposed to it going higher. But anything greater than 10% off its high is not a good thing. And anything less than 10% away from its 50 week closing high is a good thing. So if the blue line is above this little 10% line that I have drawn in as the baseline, then you know the market is dropping from its closing high. It's at least 10% away from its 50 week closing high. Now, what's kind of neat is if the market goes on to bottom out for a long, long, long time, then that closing high is going to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And then eventually you get a buy at fairly low levels. This last signal that we had with this, the sell followed by the buy, could be seen as a bit of a rip, a whipsaw, but I still think it's a cool signal, even though technically, follow mechanically, it didn't work. And I'll show you that in one second. So the buy signal here from last summer, we had one two bars of Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the 50 week moving average. This is a weekly chart, by the way. And the close obviously was within 10% of its 50 week closing high, and, or in other words, it was above the buy line, okay? And I'll flesh that buy line out just one second, a little bit more. So above the buy line, and two weeks of Landry light above the 50 week moving average. Now this was a sell that was leading up to this. To this. this was a pandemic. When the pandemic, I, sh I should say, when the pandemic was taken very seriously. So again, there's the buy line. And that's just, you take the highest close, which was happened to be right there, and multiply times 0.90, okay? That's the actual formula. I think that's the formula I gave the programmer. So, it's always going to be 10% below the 50 week closing high. And like I said a second ago, it's going to stay at that level and not drop for at least 50 weeks, okay? Until that closing high, which just got hit here, is 50 weeks back. So one week, two, three, four, five. We're just five weeks in right here. Now, just real quick, the sell signals are sell first and ask questions later, and then the buy signals or a little bit more stringent to avoid you jumping right back in. And if you were to wait for Landry Light to the downside, let's say two bars of Landry Light to the downside, well, that's about a 20% move lower from that buy line. Okay, that's 700 or so, 800 S&P points, and that's a lot, okay? <laughs> and, you, and so you would have, by getting out a little bit less stringent on that close below, okay, sell first, ask questions later, you would have avoided obviously a big slide. And again, a less stringent sell rule is better because you get out, like I said, sell first, again, not to beat that horse and ask questions later. So all we require is a close below that moving average and a close below the buy line, and then you get out. Okay. Now, this is kind of a long story, but long story endless. I have a, an account that's kind of locked up. It's an inherited account. It's sort of locked up. 
and and they're kind of jerky about it when I try to move the funds around. So I just left the funds where they are. And I really didn't like the investments that much, but this did kind of catch my eye, this uh, hard assets fund. Not that I would recommend you buy this particular fund. I'm sure there's better investments out there, but this is what they were offering. And anyway, I came in and when I was rebalancing this portfolio, so to speak, I noticed that it was above the buy line. I noticed that this fund was doing pretty good. And I was a little bullish on metals and mining back then. And this is where I actually bought in. And I'm still long. And you can see that this simple little trend following system so far has worked out pretty good, about a 25% run since I got in. And the reason I'm showing you this is not to brag or anything, because I don't know, this thing could be turned to a piece of crap longer term. But the point is that something simple like this can be used to time the market. You, you might have to change your parameters if you're doing some kind of other market, okay? And like I said, I think in yesterday's stock chart show, again, check my website on Friday, the 14th of May for that one, 2021. I talked about if you were using the byline, let's say in something like biotech or whatever, that byline might be 30%, okay? Semiconductors might be 20% away from the highs. You might have to give it a lot more room. And I'm gonna talk a lot about giving volatile positions room in just one second. But anyway, I put this little arrow on this chart months and months ago, just to give me a reference of where I got in. And so far, so good on that, knock on wood. Now, when it comes to market timing, first of all, I'm not a huge fan of buy and hold. In fact, I think it's a really bad idea. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. But if you want to build a system, rather than try to beat buy and hold, it's. I think it's good if you go in and figure out a way for the market not to beat you because those 50% haircuts are, are fairly common, okay? There was one in 2000 and one again in 2008. That's eight years apart. That's nothing, right? I mean, in, in, the, in the general longer term scheme of things, that's fairly quick. So the way I kind of saw it was I wanted to avoid those diaper change moments, those big drawdowns and just get out of the way and be able to keep your head and sleep at night while everybody else was losing theirs and losing sleep. Like this friend of mine that he, when he's down 20 something percent, all of a sudden he wants to start talking markets with me. He was visiting and he was kind of down in the dumps and depressed. And it's like, why doesn't anybody call me? Or why does anybody go in and watch shows that I did two years ago where they know what I do for a living, right? This is all I do, right? Is this. And, you know, nobody, it's like everybody waits for the bomb to blow up and then they like want to help me put it all back together again. And it's kind of like, ugh, you know, it's just, it just really sucks. And I'm not the grand poobah or anything, but some very simple little things like this 10% TFM system, which I'm giving away for free, you know, you get a system, you get a system like Oprah. I'm the over of trading systems, right? <laughs> but the point I'm trying to get to is that market timing is, is less about beating the market, although I do want to beat the market, right? And more about not letting the market beat you. So you got to sit Junior down and say, hey, Junior, you know, uh, things didn't go so well in the market that uh, Ivy League uh, education we were thinking about for you. Eh, you're going to have to go to junior college instead. now. Nothing wrong with junior college. I was public educated. <laughs> okay, no jokes, please. And, you know, I've, I've done okay. Uh, I think maybe the School of Hard Knocks is probably the best school you can go to. And by the way, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to be a trader. You could be a trend-following moron. But anyway, again, getting back to the point, you don't want the market to beat you. You don't want to lose half your money every eight years or however long we are between bear markets. So this was the last sell signal. Again, this is the ones we we're just looking at right when the pandemic began to hit in earnest, when everyone began to take it seriously. And then we had a buy, which is actually above that sell signal, okay? 
So you could argue that, well, Dave, that was just a big old fat whip sauce. Like, well, the way I look at it is, I don't know. We had a 30% haircut from that sell signal, round numbers, down to the low. And I was up close and personal with quite a few people that got really hurt. And my phone starts ringing and people start knocking on my door and, and freaking out. It's like, you know, what do you do now? The market's severely oversold. That doesn't mean it can't keep going down. So I think you have to have some kind of idea in place where are you going to get out and stop being a longer term trend follower because there's no more trend. The trend has begun to turn. You will get occasionally whipsawed when you are trading any type of market timing system. And as Greg Morris says, he was visiting several years ago and we were talking about some of this stuff. And he said, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration, okay? As a trader, it's like I, I dumped everything, did short a little bit, did okay on the short side, and then the market comes all the way right back. And it's like, ah, oh, it's a little frustrating, but you know what, I'm still here. Now, when I originally did the, the testing on this thing going back about 30 years, I wasn't completely blown away, but it did avoid the diaper change moments. And that was sort of my initial goal was to, of course, beat market timing, but more importantly, avoid the, the telling junior that he's, he's got to go to community college instead of an Ivy League school. Nothing wrong with community college. Again, I'm public educated. <laughs> so <laughs> that explains a lot, Dave. <laughs> anyway, so if you look at this, we had that last little drawdown was 28%. By the way, every time you get a, a big diaper change moment, not like the last one because the market came back, but in some of the other ones like 2008 and 2000 where it took a while to bottom out, that becomes more and more important. So again, there's your 50% round number haircuts. And then I went back in and redid it recently. I was looking at a few things and I knew the 70s were a really bad time to trade. I wasn't I wasn't trading back then. I know some of you older guys were. <laughs> I'm not that much younger than you, right? But anyway, from what I understand, it was very abysmal. I didn't start until the late 80s, early 90s. But you could see that there were some pretty serious drawdowns. And again, 29%. And again, it's not a drawdown. This is a diaper change moment. This means that you get out the market, okay? And in like going back to, let's say, 1967, you get out at a 12% profit. Okay, that's pretty good. Better than the poke in the eye, right? How long were you in? Well, you were in it for quite a long time. It really didn't pay off that big. But at least you made some money, 12%. Again, better than the poke in the eye. But you avoided a 29% spill. Okay. So you were able to sleep sitting on 12% gains while others were stressed out. And then obviously bigger than 30% is really hard to stomach. Now, when I got went further and further back, the more these avoidance or diaper change avoidance moments, by the way, diaper change comes from Ian McActivy. As I've said a thousand times, he used to give the funniest presentations and I sort of try to steal a little bit from him because he's so damn good. And diaper change is one of the terms that I picked up Anyway, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he was amazing. But you can see the 20s and 30s were a pretty abysmal time to trade. And look at that, 83%, 22%, 43%, 24%, 26%, okay? Those are all huge moves to the downside. Now, I've said this before, and I no longer talk market timing as much as I used to at cocktail parties. I know you probably want to party with me, but if I go to a cocktail party and the market's iffy, I tend to get cornered. And you know, anytime, at least locally, not you guys, but locally, everybody wants to tell me how smart they are. Nobody wants to listen to what I have to say. And that's fine. Okay. It's I I, I talk a lot. I get tired of talking, believe it or not. <laughs> and that's fine. But they don't always want to hear what I have to say, especially when it looks like it's getting a little bearish. 
I have a brother-in-law named Andy. He's not watching, so we can talk about him. <laughs> and uh, he'll ask your opinion, and you give him your opinion, and then he tells you how wrong you are in your opinion because he already made up his mind. And we call that Andying. <laughs> and we later found out there's a um, there's another term on the internet, ask, and then followed by the word whole. And uh, so that's the same kind of uh, a thing. Not not that Andy's a great guy. I love hanging out with him, but he does tend to Andy you a little bit. It's so funny. My my daughter once, when she was much younger, she's like, uh, "Dad," and you know, and she said something. And she goes, "I'm not Andy and you. I really want to hear your opinion." I'm like, "Okay." You got it. But I've been laughed at when I tell people, you know, the market might go 25 years without making much progress. And now I just don't, I just try to avoid talking market time. And anyway, you people are here because you like this stuff and you like money and you like making money and you don't want to give up a bunch of your money, right? So just grabbing a spreadsheet and then the chart makes a lot more sense too. But let's say you were just looking at where prices were. So prices, of the S&P 500 were at 21.1 in September of 1928, okay? And then look way down here in 1950, they were 18.1, okay? So you could see, and I just grabbed up into the late 40s, that if you would have bought that high and held, you'd be underwater 20, 30 years later, or 25 years later, whatever it is, but long enough to where that's a long time to hold on to something, right? Okay, we'll uh, take a look at the buy line in one second. We'll get a chance once we get to the live charts. Now, this is a hard time for a trend follower. Because these wonderful trends that we've been following, this these 500% moves, like I'll show you in one second, are now beginning to erode a little bit. And it's it's tough. It sucks. Don't get me wrong, okay? But it, it comes with the territory. And uh, Mike Moody gave a, a speech a while back at American, one of our the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting, AAPTA, which I'm proud to say I'm a member. And anybody out there who has been uh, using technical analysis as a sole means of support for, I think it's eight years, you're, uh, give me a shout out and I'll help you put together a resume to get you in. We'd love to have you. Anyway, uh, Mike Moody gave a great speech and he was talking about momentum and I asked him, I said, okay, Mike, you know, I'm a momentum guy, but one of the problems with momentum is it ends badly. And he's kind of soft spoken. He goes, Dave, if you have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. <laughs> Babies are wonderful. They're fun. But you're going to have a lot of baby poop. So the baby poop of trend following is obviously the drawdowns, especially to open positions. Now, Richard Dennis in The Way of the Turtle, or, or it was Curtis Faith who wrote that book, which Curtis Faith wrote a couple of good books, The Way of the Turtle and Trading from the Gut. I liked them both. I really did. Uh, Curtis Faith is a bit of a character. Do a Google on him. Very interesting things come up. But I like his flippant attitude, especially when it comes to markets. And I like some of the things he wrote in The Way of the Turtle. And one, I, I, I swore, I, I know I say this all the time. I swore I would never read those turtle books. I thought they were stupid. And then Larry McMillan once was like at one of the AAPTA meetings, I think, said, uh, no, 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 it's pretty good. And, and Larry told a story about how they have a, spoiler alert, uh, how they had a ping pong table in the back of one of the offices. And when there was nothing to do in the markets, they'd go play ping pong. And I think if I had a big enough office, my old office would, would have been plenty big enough, but my new office is a little smaller. I think if I had a big enough office, I'd put a ping pong table in the back, even though I'd have nobody to play with during the day. I think symbolically, I think that'd be pretty cool. Anyway, Richard Dennis, long story endless, treated open drawdown profits differently than open losses. And so what does that mean? Well, if a turtle, if he was looking at a turtle's portfolio and 
they had winners in there, but they started losing money and that those losses were coming off the open profits. He was okay with that as opposed to somebody who just had a loser and wasn't getting rid of the loser. And so that told me right away, straight out, that open profit drawdowns or like the baby poop that Mike Booty so eloquently described. So this one stopped out today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in just one second. But we had a buy here and almost immediately it seemed like it was kind of a regret, right? We're down 8% within a few days. And then it did rally enough to get the initial profit target out. But you could see that before it did that, it drew down another 8%. And then it dropped 10% like right after we got the profit target. So we got a half position left, but then that open half lost 10%. There was 11% drop here. And then this last little slide, 18% of the open profits were given up. I've had people complain to me before about giving up open profits. And, you know, this was a pretty decent trade. So I just tell them, you know, you're right. Yeah, you know, those open profits are such a bad thing. You should send them all to me. And that way you'll sleep better at night. Keep a little money out for massage. You know, you'll feel better. <laughs> Feels like tonight's the day's greatest hits, huh? <laughs> How many times have I sell these things? Now, we were stopped today. We'll talk about that in one second. But if you look at where we got in to the stop, it was a 21% move, and then some partial profits were taken along the way. And that's better than a poke in the eye. And if you annualize that, which I didn't get around to doing, but that's over, what, two and a half months? So you would do that how many times? Six times a year, maybe five times a year, if you could do that. So if every trade ended up 21%, you'd own the world pretty soon, especially with compounding. Now, let me just talk briefly about what happened with this one today because it kind of dovetails into some of the skills that we might need to brush up on now that the market's becoming a little questionable so on this one by the time i got around to figuring out where the stop was on it it had already bounced a little bit off those lows and fortunately for me and i know i'm emitting bad behavior here but i was crazy busy today it had already reversed a little bit, and I was watching the the the, the day over day change as opposed to watching the, the longer term chart and where we were and where my stop should have been placed. Most of the time, I don't put in hard stops. I don't put in hard stops until they're necessary. Okay, so thirty three fifty was a stop. It dropped to about thirty three thirty, I think, as you can see on this chart. And it had bounced a little bit above that. And I put in a hard stop at that point at 33.30. So if it took out the day's lows, I was out. And so far, knock on wood, I survived that stop nick. Now, you can't throw caution to the wind with these things. And I'm working on a piece that's going to be part of a bigger project. But one of the things I, I came up with is stop creep. Okay. And so... 33.30 was a low today. Let's say tomorrow it dips below today's low. It goes to 33. Let's 33, okay? And so it's like, oh, okay, well, that's that's kind of taking out that stop. It's a little bit lower. Let me put a stop in at 33, and it doesn't get hit at 33. And the next day, gaps down a little bit. It's at 29.90, maybe drops to 29 and a half. It's like, oh, okay, well, now it's reversing. Let me put in a stop in at 29 and a half. And if you're not careful, before you know it, that stop just kind of keeps creeping lower and you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. So that's one of the downsides of discretion. You will have to have an uncle point at some point in time. But right now I consider this a stop, Nick. If you are in a trading service and you got knocked out of this one, uh, let me know. Or I guess more importantly, let's talk about this in the Facebook group. Let me know if you stayed with it based on a stop, Nick, okay? Now, getting back to the open profit drawdowns. Okay, John's still in. Congratulations. Fantastic. So we got in this one way back in November of 2020. It's a CPE. And we were able to take partial profits fairly quickly. 
half is what we take off. So it had a 28% drawdown. Now keep in mind that this is a very volatile stock, okay? And then this little drop here, ironically, was another 28%. And then ironically, this last little spill here was 28%, okay? Now we haven't stopped out of this one yet. And when we stop out, it's gonna hurt considering where we were, okay? And that 28%, by the way, it's peak to trough. Close over close is not quite as bad. But either way, even if you go on close over close, that's a lot of profits to give up. I don't know why. My dad, you just looked at, I watched a very poor sketch where they uh, were doing the Mario Brothers. And it, was, um, it wasn't funny, but um, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> anyway, before I digress too far, me digress, imagine that. So we're still in this one. Now, I know it's hypothetical, I guess, but it was real at one point. At that peak a few days ago, we were up 546%. And that's nothing to sneeze at. So even if we stop out, it'll be 350, 400%, you know, 200, 300%, 400%, 500%. That's not bad. It's better than the poking eye, right? And let me just, I just grabbed a snapshot earlier today. This is not as of the close. You can watch tonight's service for that, obviously. But you can see there's some still pretty big profits in here. And CP is still up, what, 421%? I don't know if this is a good a good close number. Maybe it's a little bit lower than this now. But it's better than the Pokemon. on. It's a pretty big trade dollar-wise, too. ASO is another one. I think ASO is just shy of all-time highs in here, up over 100%. But along the way, if you would do the same chart, you got knocked it out, okay? Okay, Lauren, you got knocked out. No discretion allowed from me. Oh, yeah. Lauren uh, puts in his, and that's okay. Lauren puts in his orders. He's in Australia, so he has to put in his orders uh, overnight. And that's fine. Longer term, you'll do just fine. In fact, the good thing about that is it's kind of built-in discipline for you. I'm just trying to show you tips and tricks and techniques to kind of improve upon things, okay? If you have the luxury of exercising a little bit of discretion. Now, you don't want to wake up in the middle of the night, but for those guys in the States that are busy saving lives and repairing automatic transmissions and doing other great things, defending, I used to say defending good guys, and I talked to a lawyer once, oh, we don't make any money off good guys. <laughs> we defend bad guys. That's where all the money is. Anyway, if you're off doing these wonder, great and wonderful things, maybe you can have an alert go to your phone. And I know that like Thinkorswim has a pretty good alert system. And I've experimented with some of these other charting packages. Well, Thinkorswim is a brokerage, but obviously charting packages. A lot of them will send alerts to your phone, which is pretty cool. And I need to use, utilize alerts more than I do. I, you know, I'm always telling you don't stare at a screen all day. I think it's Todd Harrison, who I don't know personally. I've never met. I'm not even sure who he is, but uh, David Keller said Todd Harrison calls them flickering ticks. And I love that term, you know, flickering ticks. So you could easily get sucked in this flickering ticks. And, and every now and then I find myself getting sucked in. I was like, well, wait a minute, Dave, just put in an alert on whatever you are sitting there staring at. And if it goes above a level or below a level, whatever the case may be, then you take action. And I was, Today, my shoulder's getting tired, I'm stressed out. I'll talk a little bit about today in a second. And I got to thinking, hey, dumbass, put an alert in, and if it goes above the level, then take action. If it doesn't, then don't do anything. And in some cases, if it's a market I wanna be in, I'll just put in a stop order above the market and then go about my life, as opposed to looking at a stupid screen, or a hard stop or a automated trailing stop on an intraday trade. Okay. We've been talking about profit centers lately. And just real quick, these are ancillary profitable techniques. Profitable is a keyword in that sentence. Ideally, non correlated to the core methodology or non correlated markets. I just talked about these open profit drawdowns we're going through. And I don't want to brag or spit too high in the air, but we've had some pretty good days lately with the ETFs and that kind of mitigates those drawdowns. And if you don't get knocked out of your positions, you get to take home the intraday profit from the profit center, in this case, the ETFs, okay? And 
the positions come back. Or if they don't come back, you get knocked out. It happens. Spell it a silent SH. At least you made a little bit of money on the day on the intraday trades. Now, there's a lot of problems with this. And I've talked about that quite a bit. And a few of them I'll probably flesh out in just one second. But one of the problems is it can kind of pull you away from keeping your eyes on the prize. In other words, the core methodology is where the money is, that longer term trend following, that 500% move. And that's where the real, that's how you build real wealth longer term. These profit centers can kind of, I hate to use the word income, but can kind of supplement your income a little bit in the meantime. But there's a lot of downsides to it too. Now, last week, just real quick, I want to follow up. I was talking about trading breakouts, especially doing high RS markets, specifically what the altcoins are, as many traders call them, the shit coins. <laughs> I did see a YouTube uh, meme today where uh, some guy described uh, this this completely this completely it seemed to be worthless currency that. Uh, 25% of the supply was just increased. It has a limited supply, okay? Some of the crypto has limited supply, as you probably know. But it has a limited supply, and 25% of that, that supply was just made recently. You know, it goes on and on. And obviously, after a few things, you realize he's talking about the dollar. Anyway, I digress. So the reason I brought this up just real quick is when the altcoins are really flying, Sometimes you could just jump in midstream and buy when they're going straight up. If you see a bunch of them in the green, go in and watch last week's presentation on altcoins for more on that. And if you remember in the middle of the show, some of you guys were asking me, we talked about this in Facebook the next day, but for those of you who are in the Facebook group, in the middle of the show, I was talking about RS and this OMG looked pretty good. So I jumped in and bought some and then the next morning i sold half of it and then i got stopped out on the remainder better than the pokening eye okay held it less than 24 hours in and out got a little bit out and then i screamed next so that's how that one worked out again though if you're trading this rs and we have it it's it's funny it's like anytime i talk about trading rs and all coins all of a sudden they begin to implode okay so you have to really pay attention these things are wild and crazy. It's a wild, wild west, as many people have said, and that's, I've said ad nauseum. So you have to be super, care, super careful with that. Okay, before I shift gears here, Brett says, hey, Brett, haven't heard from you in a while. Good to hear from you. Hey, Dave, I was actually going to ask about this one today. I got in Zim back around 1450 and have been trailing my stop since. Stop is currently at 32. I think that's plausible. Given it's run higher, should I give this one a, a bit more breathing room on my trailing stop or should I let it stop me at a 32 and then re-enter on a pullback if it triggers? I think you I think you answered your own question. The second part of that is I think I think 32 is plausible. And if it gets much below 32, maybe uh would be a good time to exit. And when we get to the live charts, we'll pull it up and we'll double check on that. Now, one thing I've noticed lately is these intraday leveraged ETA, ETF trading seems to be working really well. Well, I got to thinking, big duh implied, it's like, well, the volatility has increased. And so this is just multiple volatilities and stock charts, the program named it Landry Volatility, but this is just historical volatility if you're looking at the stock charts plug-in. And this HV reading is also in Metastock and some other packages. And it may have my name on it, but I didn't invent this. Uh, I think uh, Sheldon Natenberg, Nathan Sheldenberg, I forget his name. Nate, Natenberg, I think is his name. Did a lot of volatility. And I hope I didn't give that book away. <laughs> I had boxes and boxes literally of books and I, I gave them all away and i just kept a few just because this office downsizing is probably i forget the exact i don't know what the exact measurements of this office was but i was in a thousand square feet at the other place and i'm in much less now which is fine it all comes with downsizing but anyway 
getting back to the volatility, and, and then Connors did later did some work based on Natenberg's work. It's funny, I know these names right before I get started. And then when Connors and I worked together a little bit, I kind of picked up that volatility ball and ran with it. So that's kind of how I got into the to the volatility. And I was obsessed with volatility for quite a while. And it can be a rabbit hole, and it, it, it gets, it, you got to be careful with this stuff. But it does have its uses. And one use is if you plot a lot of volatilities, you can see where the obviously the, mar the market volatility is. And the reason that volatility, the reason that uh, intraday trading has been good lately is we've got nice big ranges, okay? And the reason it wasn't good a while back was because the volatility was beginning to implode. And you could see there's little tiny ranges too. Now I've done quite a bit of work on this and I've shown some presentations. If you go way back in time, maybe about a year ago, I did uh, maybe a little bit longer. I did a lot of talk about volatility and, and looking for those Holy Grail days. A Holy Grail day, by the way, and we'll talk about this in just one second. It's like this day here starts at one end and ends at the other. It's wonderful for day trading. And on top of that, it's a wide range bar. A Holy Grail day that's narrow, it's not a Holy Grail day, but a day that starts at one and ends to the other for a narrow range is really not, doesn't really do you a whole lot of good. Anyway, so it's bad when that volatility is falling off and it's good when that volatility is increasing for the intraday trading. Tarzan speak, good, okay? <laughs> and then Tarzan speak right here, bad. <laughs> that's what my... My wife, you know, we, we studied Italian. We had a, a, a personal teacher for a while and, and he's no longer with us, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, I'd go to Italy and, and you know, she was all shy and was afraid to use her um, Italian, but not me. I'm Tarzan speak, you know. <laughs> manja, me, hey, manja, me. <laughs> speak like Tarzan. Anyway, so it's good, once again, if that volatility is rising. And one has to wonder if just kind of paying attention to this volatility can help you to know when it's good to be trading intraday on the ETFs and, and using that as a profit center. And then maybe not so good when volatility is decreasing. And I think there's something here that needs to be fleshed out further. I think this is fodder for research. And I know that if it, I always preach against day trading, and lately, I mean, like right now, my back is tight, my neck is tight, and I know that I can't keep doing this, especially at my age, forever. But ideally, with these intraday trades, you just get in in the morning and then let a trailing stop take you out, and an initial profit target gets hit. Ideally, obviously. And you don't do anything all day. You don't watch all those flickering ticks and you don't chase your tail. And I'll show you one day where I kind of chased my tail. So I'm going to get into a few of these caveats in just one second. But I'm wondering if paying close attention to the volatility might really help you to just stay out of the markets because there's no opportunities there. So I grabbed this chart last minute and looking back about a week or so. And I looked at my P&Ls on each day trading these ETFs. And it was okay on May 6th. And I lost money on May 7th. This is a 15 minute bar. You can see we had a little bit of a rally and then just chopped it around all day, okay? Didn't lose a mu much, but how much energy did I give up on May 7th and what other things could I have been doing on that day? Maybe I could have worked a little harder in a week of charts. <laughs> You'll go in and watch the last week's and go, yeah, Dave, you're right. <laughs> anyway. But then you can see the 10th was a pretty good day. The market chopped around a little bit, but then had a really good trend lower, okay? The problem is we don't have this chart until the end of the day, you know? <laughs> now, the 11th was an okay day, and it was actually a pretty good day for me. I thought it would have been more of an opening gap reversal, but I kind of chased my tail. And again, at the end of the day, pretty stressed out. Was it worth it? I don't know, because ultimately I ended up pretty big and I think I was up twice as much as I was 
at one point in time as I closed in. And I think that's because the short shares were doing really good on this dive lower, but then of course the market promptly reversed. And then obviously you come in like a day, so again, that was stressful. You come in like a day like yesterday where it gaps lower and for the most part just goes lower all day. That was a really good day, okay? Now today, this was another day where I gave up a lot of open profits and barely eked out anything. And as you'll see in one second, you know, what do you do when you're up, is it five figures or oh, four figures? Maybe four figures, okay? And then that begins to erode. And I'm gonna flesh that out in just one second. But you can see on these days where it just chops around, you don't make a whole lot of money and it just kind of stresses you out. And if you could figure out when to trade only on like these good days like this, I know you don't know it ahead of time. And even like this day here, even though it chopped around, eventually got going one way or the other. A route one day is the best market or a serious, serious opening gap reversal. And I'm going to show you these trades on the 11th. And the reason I grabbed them, I was just thinking back to whenever the 11th was, a few days ago, I thought that was the mother of all opening gap reversals. And come to find out, it wasn't. So it's kind of a lesson in chasing your own tail. I don't know how, but I ended up unscathed and actually had a good day. But you can see that this, this one here, I played the reversal from the lows, came back in, stopped out. And some of this is bad behavior. So I want to show you what I'm doing good, but also I want to show you what I'm doing bad and what it can improve upon. And that's one thing that amazes me when you get to these, some of these questions that I'm going to pose in just one second, that you could be doing this for 30 years, okay, thereabouts, and still have a lot of questions and still wonder. And it's kind of, it's very humbling because any other business, you think about 30 years in, you'd have it kind of all figured out, you know. You would kind of hope like a surgeon would, wouldn't be like, geez, this is odd. And Anyway, so that's... This is FNGU. I was trying to catch that early morning reversal. Okay, it was an opening gap reversal, at least I thought it was, and then came back in, stopped out on that one. Now, here's the thing: you could see I sort of micromanage this. If I would have just went in with a liberal stop, okay, and then had an IPT, it actually turned out to be a pretty good. Would have turned out to be a pretty good trade. And this is the ultimate goal with this intraday stuff is to get in somewhere early in the morning, not get faked out, I know, easier said than done, and then hold on all day within reason, right? And obviously I didn't put in a stop, adjusted the volatility on the side just to bail out on this one when it began to come in. So the point I'm trying to make is I did chase my tail a lot and I think I can improve upon this. Gush was another one, opening gap reversal, looked like it was going to the moon. And I think I did follow the system on this one, system being, okay, if I'm going to risk three points or whatever it is, I'm going to take profits at three points, and then I'm going to stop out when it drops three points from where it is on a trailing stop. I did go back in, I think in a smaller way, if memory serves, and take another stab at it here when it looked like it was rallying, and then came back in. That's That could maybe be seen as a shame trade. Do I have my shame bell? Shame! <laughs> <laughs> That's too loud. Anyway, now here's another case where maybe a little bit looser stop would have kept me in. I think I did follow the plan, though. The plan was okay, try not to get faked out in this opening bar, got long, took partial profits, and then stopped out and remained. I think this was just let it go type of trade. But you can see by the end of the day, it worked out pretty good. And I did. I do sometimes trade late in the day. Sometimes you can catch a little trade late in the afternoon, but you have to be careful again not to chase your own tail. And, you know, I guess at one end is what you need to think about at what cause or at, um, at what's this, how's the saying go? At what end? Um, COVID brain, forgetting, trying to figure out what's that saying. Now, this is what I micromanage, okay? So, if I would just kind of follow the system, the system being we could give it plenty enough room, could have gotten in here, taken partial profits probably in here, and then trail a stop higher and then get out by the end of the day. But I micromanage it and again, you know, at what cost? I think is what I'm trying to say, the cost of stressing out and watching the screen too much. Okay. 
Uh, this one's kind of a shame, Trey. I'm not going to ring the bell. It hurts my ears. <laughs> but you can see I tried to catch that low. I tried to get smart. I, I caught some early trades early on, and I began to chase my tail a little bit. And so the reason I'm showing you all this, initially, I wanted to show you how great I am and how it was an opening gap reversal and it all played out. And then after I really looked at the trades, and by the way, I, I probably need to do a lot more of this and, and having doing the show forces me to do it because I would never go back and look at trades I did a week ago and sometimes not even today, right? But going back in and looking through them, and I know hindsight's 2020, but there's a lot of things to be fleshed out. So I'm showing you here that I chased my tail a lot. It worked, okay? But I don't want to be in and out this much. That's not the ultimate goal with this ETF type of trading. But you can see here, got in. This one might have stopped out on a normal stop, and I need to document these things better. And I'm I'm guilty of that. And I'll check my notes. I do have a trading journal, but I find when I start doing all this um, intraday trading, I fill up a page in like 20 minutes. So, but I did this one played. I think I played this one okay. I think this was a trailing stop, stopped me out because the market was volatile. And then I got back in right here, and then I exited on the close. So this one worked out okay. I think that was the biggest winner of the day. And then, again, chasing my own tail. That was Sox L. This is Sox S. So I'm trying to play both ends against the middle. One thing good about these shares is if you're losing money in one, somebody else is making money in the other. So you need to kind of think about that. Uh, George says, what about a one- or two-hour chart? Well, nothing wrong with that. There, there's kind of a sweet spot. You'll notice a couple of those trades I entered on the first 15 minutes. You can't, as I said a thousand times, you can't wait for the first 15 minutes, although many days I wish I would have. And I think if maybe if you're a little newer to this, then maybe you just be, okay, if it just goes straight up first 15 minutes, you just let it go. And then you look to play another day. The only problem is one of those days every now and then, or maybe more than one of those days, will turn into a holy grail day where it starts at the low and then just goes straight up all day. If you don't get in on that first 15 minutes, you're going to miss so much of the move, you might be too late. Now, a one or two hour chart would be useful, as we've talked before, to kind of give you a signal a longer term of, of a possible longer term top looming. So I know one of the guys in the group does a lot of work with like hourly charts and that's where some of his market timing comes off of. And that's that's a great thing to do because it's gonna get you out the market really, really early, right before a big spill. I guarantee you he was out of the market days before the market began to implode in earnest when the market began to take that pandemic the pandemic seriously. I take it seriously now. <laughs> COVID nearly killed my ass. <laughs> 10 days in and I was forced to go to the ER. I don't want to go. I went ticketing and screaming. $3,000 later, <laughs> they gave me a bag of fluids. Oh, well, I guess they could have been worse. So better safe than sorry, right? Who knows? I mean, without those fluids, maybe I wouldn't be here. Anyway, yes, you could use shorter term charts for longer term timing. I don't know if a hourly chart, it, it'd be really hard to trade off an hourly chart, but it would get rid of some noise. And I've said the story a thousand times and somebody thanked me for repeating it the thousandth time last week or whenever it was, but I was trading S&P futures or attempting to trade S&P futures and one day I came in and I rebooted the, um, I'd reboot my brokerage for whatever, you know, you come in overnight and the stupid Microsoft reboots your computer overnight, you know, and then you gotta, oh, you gotta load everything back up. Anyway, I came in one day and it's like, uh, you know, I'd be getting chewed up in the S&Ps for days and days and days. And it's kind of like beating your head against a wall. It feels so good when you stop, you know, <laughs> it's like, what the hell am I doing? And it came in and there was nothing to do, nothing to do, nothing to do, nothing to do. It's like, okay, whatever. Okay, I guess they're just really, really choppy. I'm just going to sit on my hands. 
And then I don't remember exactly when, but later in the day, all of a sudden it started breaking out. So, you know what? This looks pretty good. So I hopped in, made money. Next day, same kind of thing happened. I'm like, what the hell's going on? It's just choppy, 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 choppy. And then eventually I made money. Now, don't make money every day doing this. If I did, you'd never see my fat ass again. But I lose a lot less money than I used to. And then net, net, it's worked out okay. I don't want to spit too high in the air. The S&P trading has worked out over the last week or so. Volatility is high, Dave, and that's probably why. But the point I'm trying to make, believe it or not, I have one, is by looking at a slightly longer time frame, I'm not looking at that five-minute bar to see to go straight up and just getting all excited, like, oh, it's going to the moon and just hop in. And waiting on that, looking at that 15-minute bar, it doesn't look like as big of a move. And I'll tell you this. Anytime I find myself drilling down to a one minute bar, something's wrong. Okay. I need to really, I need to not be trading that market. It's too volatile. I know I got sucked into some game stock trading a while back. I was doing options trading on it and then outright trading. And, and, you know, before you knew it, I found myself in that one minute chart getting sucked into those flickering ticks. <laughs> and it was a bad idea. So one reason I'm showing you these ETFs, getting back to ETFs, is that I did kind of chase my tail on this day. And that's one thing you got to be really careful of. Now, luckily, it did eventually trend, okay, with these guys. And I did okay overall. But here's one you can see T, uh, QQQs. I got in here. I got knocked out here, okay, because I thought it was a mother of all reversals, opening gap reversals. Didn't trade the first 15 minutes because like, okay, let's just see how far it's going to go. And then, oh, you know what? I'm forced in. And then it came right back in, knocked me out because I micromanaged myself out. But you could see if I had just stayed with the original trade, not that it would always work, but by giving it plenty of wiggle room, maybe I could have held for what turned out to be a trend day. Okay. So a little, uh, little confession on that. So here's some leverage etf thoughts and questions and i was thinking earlier today it's okay to admit that you don't have all the answers you know i know i'll come i might come across as a grandpa boss sometime but like i said earlier sometimes it amazes me that you still might doubt yourself or have questions even after doing this for a long long time and i've had the pleasure of working with a lot of you guys on a one-on-one -on -one basis and some of you guys who who run circles around me will get to talking and we're both kind of like oh man geez this is really this is really tough i'm really getting beat up today or whatever so we all have bad days we all wonder why we don't have the holy grail even though we know there isn't holy grail but anyway i think it's okay to ask questions i think it's okay for me to say i don't have all the answers i'm working on it but i don't have all the answers and kind of some thoughts and questions here is maybe play one theme versus chasing your tail so on the 11th i guess the theme was sort of like okay this is a possible opening gap reversal market maybe i need to be focusing mostly on the long side i made a little money here and there on some of the short shares but i think the real money was in catching like the Sox l or something and riding it all day so maybe kind of think about a theme of the day, and if a theme doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And I know that's a little tricky because you might have a gap lower, and then it might just start dropping like a rock, and then you're playing that gap and go, okay? And that's that's kind of tough, and then that reverses, then you're back to playing the opening gap reversal. Point I'm trying to make is be really careful, and, and maybe maybe I would do a lot better if I just tried to focus on one theme and not chase my tail so much. You know, but at what cost? I think is what I was thinking about earlier, trying to think about. So I had a really good day on the 11th, but at what cost? And I also was was up about twice as much as I closed in on the day. So that's something to think about too. I think all that tail chasing can take its toll. And my ego gets involved a little bit too, because I'm like, I'm Dave Landry, you know, and I should be able to get on the right side of the market if the right side is following it lower for a while and then the right side is following it back up. Now, as you can see, all this takes its toll, right? And how much is this taking away from my longer term trend following? And if I get too sucked into this, am I gonna miss the next CPE trade? So it's all a balancing act and it's all about moderation. I think I've said this before, 
Italy's got me thinking about it. I want to go back to Italy. I mean, they're, uh, they told me they're going to bring me back as soon as the pandemic dies down. So I need to, my, I need to get my passport renewed and can't wait. Um, but anyway, my, my, uh, I almost said my mom, <laughs> my wife and I were, were touring Pompeii and we had a, a sweet little old ex professor and, uh, he was, bringing us around Pompeii and he said, well, the, the excesses of Pompeii were their downfall, obviously. And he said, if you figure out moderation, write me a letter. And so I think you've got to figure out your profit centers and, and moderation. I know a couple of you guys, and I've been a little sucked in too. These altcoins lately, it's just been amazing, but it comes and goes and you got to be careful not to chase your own tail and know when to back off there too. Now, one thing that I haven't completely wrapped my head around, and, and you got to keep in mind that I've been following my longer term trend following methodology, my swing to intermediate term methodology, I guess you should say, for a long, long time, and I know what to do. Okay. So, CPE, I know what to do. If it hits a stop, I need to get out, unless it looks like it's a stop, Nick, and those little things I talk about. But with this intraday stuff, even though I've I've done a little intraday trading on and off, it's it's not my bread and butter. So one thing I've got to kind of wrap my head around is if I'm up five figures, five figures or four figures, four figures. If I'm up five figures, that's a really good day, right? If I'm up four figures on on a small account, say one percent or a percent and a half on a small account or two percent. Is that enough to lock in? Now, I'm a firm believer that you have to trade for unlimited gains, okay? But there might be some sort of happy medium when it comes to the day trading. And I'd be happy to, to I'd love for you guys to talk about this and we'd see if we could flesh it out a little bit. If you're not on Facebook, leave a comment below on YouTube. And I think we can kind of noodle with it. But I, I still think deep down, that you have to set yourself up for unlimited gains. Now, I have a friend of mine who's a bit of a scalper type, and he seems to think that I might be not swinging for the fences so much, but my longer term trading training, okay, might be kind of creeping into, you know, trying to catch every day as a trend day, and every day doesn't turn into a trend day. So I like to throw that out for questions, but I do think for answers or, or comments, I should say, but I do think you should sort of set yourself up for somewhat unlimited gains. And I guess the question is, how often do unlimited gains come along? How often is that, does that holy grail day come along where it's kind of a route one way? So my dilemma here is a gift horse. You know, I'm 30 minutes into trading. Let's say I'm up 2K on, on 100K accounts. I'm up 2%, you know. How often do you make 2% in 30 minutes? You know? So it's kind of like, it's a little bit uh, tricky there. Now I am doing the money management to where I am taking half of those profits off and trailing on the rest. So it's not like I don't have a complete plan, but it is hard to watch that open profits erode during the day, okay? And it's kind of like, okay, if I were to just start the morning and then went off and ran errands or whatever, came back in the day, and I'm up 1% on the day, I would feel pretty good about that. But, and here comes the neurology and the psychology and all, not to, just too much to get into, but if you're up 2,000 and by the end of the day, you're only up 1,000, it's like that psychology of losing, so to speak, that $1,000 kind of weighs on you a little bit. And obviously multiply that times, when I say 1,000, I'm talking about like, let's say $100,000. So 1%, you know, so you're up 2%, then you're down 1%. End of the day, if you made 1% every day, you don't in the world, right? End of the day, you should be happy with 1%, but it's like, I'm the, I don't feel happy if I'm up 2% and lose 1%. Just the opposite in a longer term trend following, I don't view those profits as mine until I lock them in, okay? And then I'm okay with giving up some of those open profits. And I actually, and, and this comes from reasoning from Peter Brandt that I talked about lately or recently, is that Peter Brandt doesn't see those profits as his until he locks them in. So Laurent, you locked in profits on that CME. 
So put that money in your spreadsheet as a gain and be happy with that gain as opposed to looking at what you lost. I know it's human nature to look at what you lost or gave up, I should say, versus what you made. Now, you got to be careful because my eagle curve begins to climb too. It, it kind of feels like steady income. I had, I forget how many days in a row, like six days in a row or seven days in a row where it was starting to feel like a little income machine and then she got chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up. And I bet if I went and looked at the volatility, that was probably a period where that volatility was coming off. So I would say, and this is what I'm going to do, but document, document, document. And it's very time consuming to do that. But I think it's also kind of enlightening too. And I think I learned a lot from the, the 11th. I hope you kind of can learn a little bit vicariously through me, through my tail chasing, not vicariously, but through my tail chasing. Holy grail days would be the absolute awesome, okay? Unfortunately, I think they're impossible to predict. And if anybody has any suggestions on that, please let me know. Go in maybe to give some ideas in, in the presentations I've done in the past where I actually created an indicator that would measure the days since we had a holy grail day. And maybe I need to run that in all the ETFs and see what I come up with. I just thought of something here. This is why I like teaching because I learned myself. So maybe that's something like, how many days has it been since we had a holy grail day? And again, I'll try to find this presentation and put a link in the comments below. It was a YouTube presentation a while back. As I said earlier, rising volatility does help. Uh, ogres, I think, can be a gift horse. And if it's a big gap, it's a gap and go, meaning the gap's lower and keeps going down, then by all means, chase it down, uh, not chase it down, but go with it, okay? I think there's times where extreme overbought and oversold might work too. So maybe there's a way, I think what I'm, what I'm going for here without being a holy grail hunt is what type of daily filters would really help to get you A, closer to the holy grail day and, and B, maybe not chasing your tail so much, okay? I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard, as I've said before. And I think there's some chances of that. So, by the way, review the methodologies, re review the archives, and hopefully when I'm editing this tomorrow, believe it or not, they are edited <laughs> a little bit. I'll try to edit it out too much. I will uh, update the archives so they'll be fairly current. And you can go in, of course, you can go in and look at the CPE trade and go look at the Zim trade. And I would say 99% of all the trim, trim trades that I mentioned in these presentations come directly from that. The ancillary stuff, I'm kind of noodling with that. All right, so let's hop into the overall market. Let's take a look at some of these questions first. Okay, so Brett was asking about Zim, and he also happens to be in Zim too. Good eye, congratulations on that one. And I think 32 is plausible, okay? So I would just leave your stop at 32. Let's see what happens. And, you know, take it in context. Now, the shippers have been doing better than the overall market. But take it in context with the – within the context that the overall market's looking a little questionable. Yeah, George says hit 4K, take it. Yeah, it depends on your account size, obviously. You know, another one of my problems with it lately that I, I one thing I didn't mention is your trading spills over into your life, your life spills over into your trading. And I was bragging, my trading was going really well a few months back and I was bragging to my wife and I uh, said, let's put a pool in, let's put an outdoor kitchen in, let's do all this stuff, you know? And um, she's like, how are you gonna pay for it? I, I know I told this before, but she's like, I'm like, oh, just you know, take some money out of savings or whatever. She goes, well, you're making all this money. You know, why don't you help pay for it? I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> so some of this pressure I'm putting on myself by going in and doing those intraday trades, and I've been taking half of those profits and put them aside to help pay for some of the stuff, you know, toys and things like that. So I got to be careful to not put myself under too much pressure. Anyway, getting back to the Zim. Yeah, I think you're fine at 32. I mean, stock is not broken yet. I mean, even if it goes to 32, it could just be pulling back and still be a setup. But if you've been in it for a while, I think that's a plausible setup, especially since it made it all the way up here. But it, yeah, it could pull back to almost, I'd say almost 30 and would still look 
pretty good as a viable setup. So I think you're doing the right thing on that one, Brett. Good job. Nice work. By the way, I say this every week, like my work was easy today in these position trades because most of the position trades are the same trades that most of my position trades that are open are the same trades that are in the service. And I've already laid out that plan. So it's like, it's like, okay, well, what's getting hit? What's getting hit? Okay, Zim's getting hit. Let me see where the stop is. Oh, wow, it's already hit the stop. I need to think about getting out. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute, it just barely kind of nicked it. I think we're okay. I'm going to go ahead and stick with it. So at least I had that kind of plan in place. And during the heat of battle, I'm like, oh, crap, everything's kind of coming unglued. All right, this one's got a long ways before the stop. You know, it's going to suck. Try not to look at it too much. This one's actually might need a little action. So what I'm trying to say is have that plan in place to begin with, okay? Lauren says, talking about Zim, no hard feelings for me. Swing trading with tight stop is a lot harder when you're not watching the market live. Well, that's, you're in longer term trend following mode. But I don't have hard feelings. Well, you know what? I hope you have hard feelings from that profit. So you send them to me, so no more hard feelings. <laughs> 20 something years of uh, being public here and saying that I've never gotten the check in the mail from that. I've gotten the tip before. I've just actually, this is the first year. I, well, I had a tip jar once on like on a website. I get like a little tip here and there, but I, I got a sizable tip uh, recently, which was uh, really nice. Somebody had made a lot of money and they wanted to thank me. So, so I can't say that I've never gotten a check in the mail, but I've never gotten a check from somebody who was aggravated with open profits. All right. I digress. All right, let's take a look at the market. Let me just show you real quick. Uh, well, we could jump into ACP in one second. Before we do that, let's take a look at the P's. So S&P 500, what do we have now? Well, it's working on a bow tie, okay? And as long as we stay below the moving averages, they will cross over, they will get a bow tie. But the market is pretty close to 30, as you can see. This is a 30, this is a 20, those are exponential, the 10 simple. All we need is one big day to get back above, and then we will avoid the bow tie in the S&P 500. Now, before I forget, let's take a look at the spiders. And somebody was saying day trading or intraday trading. I try to call it intraday trading. I don't want to be a day trader, right? In and out, in and out, like the rag on for cocaine. So we don't have a bow tie yet down in the spiders, although we could of all-time highs. But if we take a look at an hourly chart, let's see what we have. I don't know, okay? Yeah. OK, so this is why, remember, remember I said earlier, somebody was timing off the one hourly chart for the longer term investment decisions. Well, look at this beautiful bow tie here. And I didn't know it coming in. Believe me, I just knew it was there based on the fact that the daily is about to change. So I figured the hourly already did. But look, you got all time highs. You got a bow tie, a little bit of a pullback. This is pretty textbook in nature. OK. So. Every market top, write this down, every market top will have a bow tie or some other transitional pattern, likely a bow tie, on a one-hour top, one-hour chart. Now, every one-hour bow tie won't turn into the mother of all tops, but it's probably not a bad idea to begin to pay attention when you start getting bow ties off of all-time highs. So that would be the mother of all cherry-picked examples if we just grabbed this recently, but hey, as you can see, occasionally it pays to pay attention to that. So yeah, use a one hour chart to kind of help you get your bearings as to where we are, okay? But then if you're gonna do like the intraday trading, figure out the sweet spot somewhere between a, a tick chart, a one minute chart and an hourly chart, maybe a 15 minute chart will help you to see things a little better. You place any merit or weekly wide wearing bars? Well, yeah, it depends. It's, okay, let me re-roll in there. Do I place any merit with weekly wide range bars? Well, if you've got a wide range bar to the downside in a weekly, then as we say in Fargo, you betcha. I'm not from Fargo. People are like, are you from Fargo? No. <laughs> what was that movie? Yeah, yeah. That's your friend, the wood chipper. What is that movie? Fargo. <laughs> Yeah, if I see a weekly bar like from there to there, what is that? Let's measure that. Look at that bar, it's huge. I knew Tiny Elvis would eventually come out. So that's 11, that's 12%. 12% pretty much in a week. You betcha I pay attention to that. And then let's take a look at this one here. So that's 
18% in a week. You know, I'm not going to rush out and buy stocks if it's down 18% in a week, you know? So yeah, from that standpoint, yeah. And you know what? We might have backed into something here. What do we have down? What do we have in the P's? Outside day bar on the weekly, okay? That's got me a little bit concerned, but when we get to the ACP platform in one sec, we'll take a look at the 10% buy line. We're okay for now, okay? For now being a keyword in that sentence. But yeah, more to your point, George, we got a wide range bar down sort of in the NASDAQ. Let's measure that and see what we're see how much we're down for the week. Oops. Where did my thing go? Uh-oh, I just fudged something up. Talk amongst yourselves. Let's see. We we're here and went to here. So yeah, it's about four percent. Oh, I guess I can look right here. It's four percent, yeah. So that's nothing to sneeze at. So that looks a little ugly. Let's get. Oh, look at those funny look. Look at those charts. They're funny looking. <laughs> Y'all see those charts? Those are funny looking. What the hell was that? What did I hit? All right, S&P 500. A little bit of a bounce today. Like I just said, below the bow tie moving averages, but one or two big up days would put us pretty close to all time highs. I sure would like to see this gap filled here before getting too excited about the markets. All gaps are not filled. Do not believe that. That's some BS that somebody dreamed up. Sometimes you might go years without filling a gap. Let's hope it's not the case. Okay, this gap right here really hadn't been filled in the NASDAQ and it's been what? A couple of weeks, okay? Might go a couple of years, all right? Anyway, don't believe me, go in and look at your charts. NASDAQ, like I said, is uh, bow tying down. If we have a bounce, it's gonna be a sell signal. It's also a double top, those keep it score, okay? Not the end of the world, but a double top nonetheless and a bow tie really soon. So I'd be a little concerned about that. What's a little bit more concerning is the Russell 2000. I've been saying this ad nauseum, especially in the daily trading service, my core trading service, that it's a head and shoulders top. You can't time off a head and shoulders, right? But you can certainly pay attention to them when they happen. And if you get a bow tie within that head and shoulders, it could be a harbinger. Is that the word I'm looking for? Could be an omen, okay? But if we have one or two big up days, we're back above the moving averages and we're okay. But I think you need to pay attention. Energy is one of the few areas looking pretty good. Broke out past its old highs. I would have liked to see it go a little further, but so far just pulling back. So far looking okay. Metals and mining look fantastic. Just so far just kind of pulling back in here, looking pretty good. Gold is improving. Gold really hadn't helped the metals much, but now gold is improving. Silver's kind of all over the place. Although silver, the commodity, looks a little bit better. Kind of looks like gold, the commodity. Nice little uptrend trying to develop here. A little bit of a pullback. Maybe the Reddit boys. Reddit boys were over here, tried to push it higher. Couldn't. They, they found out the market was bigger than them, as most people will eventually. Gold actually looks a little better. Nice little uptrend from lows. A little bit of a pullback. It's got a lot of overhead supply to deal with. I wouldn't buy gold, the commodity, just yet. Maybe some gold stocks would be okay. But you can see lots of overhead supply to deal with. Now, before I get too far off from that tangent, let's just drill down to a couple areas in here. Banks are looking okay. So far, so good in the banks. I got one little bank stock, EBC, I think, in my portfolio. Been boring me to death, but then when I looked at the percentage gain, it's huge. It's uh, like Tony Ellis, it's huge. <laughs> and I was kind of bummed out. It was actually down a day or two recently. Like, oh, I, th I thought that stock just went up. But you see banks look pretty good in here. Insurance looks pretty good too. As you can see, accelerated higher so far, pulling back decent data there. there. So these, those are two good looking areas. Drugs look okay, especially when you compare it to biotech. They're kind of basing in here. They really are relatively unscathed given the slide in the market, at least recently. So that's certainly improving. It doesn't look as good as metals and mining or the banks, some of those other areas. Biotech, different story. As you can see, just banged out some new multi-month lows, new lows for the year. Also has bow tie down. I'm not so worried about this bow tie as I would be about this one off of all-time highs. As I often say, you get a bow tie off of all-time highs, that top remains in place until it gets taken out. So, so far, my wife hates when I say this, but a gun to my head, it's still a top in biotech and they're still headed lower. 
Health service is one of the better looking areas for a while. It's now beginning to look a little dubious in here. Not the end of the world just yet, but it needs to begin to rally at some point. Otherwise, we could have a bow tie of all time highs there. Manufacturing looking okay so far, just pulling back. MNC so far, just pulling back. I'm seeing some MNC stocks setting up tonight. Either they're going to work or they're going to continue or they're going to continue to slide. It, it looks like they're kind of at a, uh, an M, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a, a critical juncture. But so far, I think MNC still looks pretty good. Material construction. Retail got smacked in here recently. It looks okay longer term, but I think it's on the cusp of rolling over or could be on the cusp of rolling over. So we need to pay attention there. Transport still look fantastic. Most tech looks like the NASDAQ itself. Biotech doesn't look good, obviously. We just said that. Computer software looking like it could be in trouble. Semiconductors have bow tied down. It also has a first thrust here. So this is a first thrust and then a bow tie would be complete on a little bit of a rally. So that has me a little bit concerned. All right, you guys want to ask about individual stocks. We can do so now. I know that since we started the Facebook group, a lot of those questions are already answered or get answered on a fly, I should say. So just hopping out quickly to the ACP platform. And let's take a look at the... We can take a look at the S&P 500 of the spiders. It doesn't really matter. Let's see if we make one of these bigger. And so all I'm going to do is we're going to see if we have it in here somewhere. So TFM 10%, I have this built in. By the way, do you, do you guys know how to share these? Because I'll be happy to share anything I'm doing with you tonight. Uh, put it in the comments below if you're on YouTube. By the way, I don't ask for people to... Hit the notification button, but I'm going to start doing that, okay? So hit the notification button if you, and then hit the like button if you like it, and subscribe on YouTube, and that way you'll get notified when new videos come out. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. Okay, here's the TFM 10% system. It triggered, like I said, a long time ago, way back in June. Again, you could argue it was a whipsaw filter, whipsaw type of signal. But even with this little sell-off, this is a weekly chart that we just had recently. You can see we still have a ways to go before we're down to the buy line, and then quite a ways to go before we're down to the 50-week moving average. So I don't see any reason to get too excited, at least vis-a-vis -vis this system. Yeah, we could have a bow tie down soon, maybe some shorter-term signals. But I think we're okay, at least based on this metric. Now, what was amazing, as I've said a thousand times, was this weekly signal back here triggered long before, or not long before, but before some of the shorter term daily signals triggered. So I thought that was kind of kind of cool and interesting. And it would be kind of fun. I know you want to party with me, but it'd be fun to go in and see when the hourly bow tie triggered on this on this slide here. And I, I, if anybody has hourly charts going back that far, not enough time to do it tonight. But when I'm uh, maybe when I'm editing, I'll go back in and we'll take a look at the hourly bow tie on that, and I'll I'll add it into next week's presentation. Anyway, based on the TFM 10% system, we're okay for now. Okay, in the piece. All right, let's um, switch back over. Yeah, keep the keep the picks coming. Hey, Kurt, good to see you, buddy. Kurt, we need to get you in the uh, Facebook group. I don't know if you don't do Facebook or not, but uh, love to have you. So let me change to the... Kurt's been with me forever. <laughs> you must be old because you've been with me forever. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. I don't hear from you much, but good to, good to see you, man. Okay, the question is TGB, sort of a TKO. TGB, yes, I like TGB. I'm actually long TGB right now. And I was getting whacked a little today. And when I looked at the daily chart, I'm like, you know, it looks pretty good. Yeah, I like it, Kurt. I really do. Um, you know, it's almost textbook because it's it's kind of accelerated higher. It broke out past these past prior highs in here. One cup of coffee next week, Dave. Yeah, I think it looks pretty good. I think you can almost get in above the high. And I'm not just talking my position. Well, yeah, you know, cash in the kids' college fund. <laughs> In the grandkids' college fund, put all your money in this. No, I'm half kidding. Uh, yeah, it looks good. 
I think it's uh, definitely a good looking stock. I'll give you a high five on that. And you know, I'm, I'm already long, I've already taken partial profits. And this was in the Landry list. I don't remember when, but a while back. Um, and that's probably where I got long. But yeah, good uh, good job on that. Good to see you too, again. AVGO, AVGO, yeah, AVGO I think is in, wait, AVGO, first thrust? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's back this out a little bit. And this is the thing, you know, good eye because these semis, we need to start watching them. Um, I didn't put this one on tonight because it was. Uh, I know a lot of guys, you guys don't trade these super high uh, price stocks, and I wanted to see it rally a little bit more. So the question is, is this a first thrust? I would say yes. It's been a little choppy on its way down, but maybe I would like to see it bounce a little bit, maybe a little bit closer to 450. But I think you, I think you're on to something. I think it's a potential short. And then back the chart out a little bit, and lo and behold, you had a bow tie. Actually, a bow tie was right here. Interesting, see? But yeah, I think you're right. I think that's a first thrust. First thrust is a big thrust lower, followed by a pullback. And technically, a higher, high, higher, high, low. Technically, it would be a short below this low here. Although I would wait for it to rally a little bit, but I do like it. I mean, that might be kind of a Russian doll type of trade. Go in and take an intraday trade below today's low, okay? And I think you might be on to something. I don't know if you want to hold longer term on the short side. This Russian doll thing we've been talking about lately might actually work out better. I mean, look at this day here. You ended up with what a holy grail day down. Look at that. That's pretty amazing. So yeah, I think you're onto something in that one. I'd like to see a little bit more of a bounce unless you're maybe doing, like I said, an intraday trade, okay? Brett says, great, always appreciate the help. You're welcome, Brett, good to see you. It's like, uh, where, are you, where have you been, Brett? I hadn't seen Brett in a while. Everybody's been uh, hiding out. Good to see you guys resurfacing. Okay, any more questions? While we're in impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If there's anything unanswered, uh, bring it up at Facebook. We'll we'll all have a look. And it's always good to to have other you guys chime in on those things. It's not it's not about me, as you know. I'm not the grand poobah there. I get involved with the conversations, but a lot of a lot of times by the time we get around to answering something, five or ten of you guys have already jumped in, which I really appreciate, by the way. If you want to know more about that, I've got a, a neural about that long, but just go to daylander.com slash members and you can find out more there. I want to thank everybody again for watching tonight, attending live. And again, if you want to attend live, daylander.com, daylandry.com slash webinar. Everybody have a great weekend and may the trend be with you.